everyone. Uh, welcome to this segment of the Federalist Society's Executive Branch Review. Uh, our panel today is entitled Testing the Tension, How Do Non-Discrimination Regulations Interact with Religious Freedom? My name is Austin Rogers. I am the Chief Civil Counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, I also serve on the Religious Liberties Practice Group uh, on the Executive Committee here at the Federalist Society. If you have any questions about our practice group and what we do, please feel free to reach out to Nate Kazmarek or myself, uh, but just in general, uh, the Religious Liberties Practice Group hosts debates, discussions, panels, uh, you know, much like the Federalist Society does writ large, and our uh, topics pertain to uh, religious liberties, First Amendment, religion clauses, et cetera. So with that, uh, very excited about our panel today. Um, we will be having uh, a discussion about a very important topic. Uh, over the last decade or so, um, religious liberties and non-discrimination protections have grown in, to, to be in increasing tension with each other. And this is often found expression through cases that you're all familiar, familiar with, including uh, you know, Masterpiece Cake Shop, Fulton v. Philadelphia, uh, 303 Creative, but it's also uh, grown in tension uh, more recently through executive action, and that includes agency regulations pertaining to SOGI. Uh, I'm not gonna get into any of those agency regulations today, but our panel will, um, and I'll leave it to them to introduce those and flesh those out. I will, however, introduce our moderator, who we're very fortunate to have with us today. Uh, so we have with us today Elizabeth Slattery, moderating her panel. Uh, she serves as the Director of Constitutional Scholarship at the Pacific Legal Foundation. Uh, and there she leads a team that produces and promotes legal theories among elite legal audiences, which of course, uh, in my mind, includes you guys. Um, and that is all to prepare the grounds for courts and policymakers to uphold the rule of law. Elizabeth's scholarship focuses on the separation of powers, for which she's an ardent evangelist, and her work has appeared in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, the Federalist Society Review, uh, Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and even notably in uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch's Supreme Court opinion. Uh, that's just to name a few. Elizabeth has testified before Congress and is a frequent legal commentator in print, radio, and television. In fact, uh, as a Supreme Court superfan, Elizabeth has also created, produced, and hosted two hit podcasts about the Supreme Court, and her newest project, SCOTUSLadies.com, chronicles what's happening at the court. Elizabeth received her JD from George Mason's Antonin Scalia School of Law, where she learned the art of orig originalist interpretation, and she got her uh, undergraduate degree from Xavier University, where she learned the art of questioning absolutely everything, <laughs> and she learned it from the Jesuits, and those are her <laughs> words, not mine. Uh, so with that, uh, we've got an impressive moderator today. We have an impressive panel. Thank you all for being here, and I'll let Elizabeth take it away. Thanks. Thank you, Austin. So on January 20th, 2021, President Biden announced an executive order directing agency heads to review all existing regulations, guidance, documents, and the like to ensure they comply with the Supreme Court's reasoning in Bostock versus Clayton County. In that case, the court held that Title VII's prohibition on sex discrimination in employment extends to discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. The court acknowledged concerns that expanding the scope of sex discrimination under Title VII may require some employers to violate their religious convictions. Writing for the majority, Justice Gorsuch noted, we are also deeply concerned with preserving the promise of the free exercise of religion enshrined in our Constitution. But he observed that how RIFRA and other statutory protections interact with Title VII is a question for future cases. Justice Alito's dissent anticipated many of the regulatory actions that we're going to talk about today extent, um, that would extend Bostock. This session will discuss proposed regulations involving healthcare, education, and employment, among others. While pro-LGBT groups have praised many of these proposals, religious organizations and people of faith have raised concerns. Do these regulations correctly balance the interests on both sides? Did the agencies overreach by expanding Bostock to new areas? And how will the First Amendment, RIFRA, and other federal protections for free exercise and conscience rights interact with these regulations? Our panelists will tackle these important questions and many others. 
I'm going to keep their introductions brief so you have more time to hear from them and less from me. Um, first up, and I'll introduce them in the order that they'll speak. Uh, first, we'll hear from Andrea Pachati Bayer. She's the director of the Conscience Project, an organization dedicated to the advancement of religious freedom, conscience protections, and parental rights. Prior to leading the Conscience Project, Andrea served as a trial and appellate attorney in the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice. She's also a legal analyst for EWTN News, uh, a regular columnist for the National Catholic Register, and her work has been featured in a number of outlets, including the Wall Street Journal. And notably, she's the mother of 10 children, which I think is the biggest accomplishment. <laughs> Uh, then we'll hear from Julie Marie Blake. She serves as senior counsel for regulatory litigation at Alliance Defending Freedom. Over the last decade, Julie has been on the front lines of high-profile, precedent-setting cases challenging federal overreach in courts across the country. She previously served as Deputy Solicitor General for the State of Missouri and as Assistant Solicitor General for the State of West Virginia. And Julie was once the recipient of the National Association of Attorneys General's coveted Best Brief Award for her Supreme Court work. And then last but not least, we'll hear from Marty Lederman. <laughs> He's a professor from practice at Georgetown University Law Center, where he teaches courses on constitutional law and the law of religion, among others. Marty served as an attorney advisor and later as deputy assistant attorney general in the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel. And he's a regular contributor to Balkanization, SCOTUS blog, and Slate, among many other outlets. So with that, Andrea, the floor is yours. Let me know if, if there's a problem with the sound. Um, but thank you, Elizabeth, uh, for that nice introduction. Yes, the 10 children are things that I'm most proud of. Um, and it's really an honor to be with a, such a distinguished panel today to talk about something that I think is really important and something that I hold dear to my heart. Um, I'd like to start off our conversation this morning with what sounds like a radical idea to some people in America today. Because religious freedom is a universal human right, it's the obligation of the executive branch to both safeguard it and promote it. This is particularly true when the executive branch advocates policies that are objectionable to people of faith using non-discrimination laws. Now to make such a claim, I'll start with the first assertion that religious freedom is a universal human right. As a Catholic, I'm guided by the church's teaching on religious freedom, specifically Dignitatis Humanae, explains that, quote, the right to religious freedom has its foundation in the very dignity of the human person, as this dignity is known through the revealed word of God and by reason itself. The right of the human person to religious freedom is to be recognized in the constitutional law whereby society is governed and thus it is to become a civil right. My friend Daniel Philpot of Notre Dame adds additional thoughts to this notion of religious freedom as a human right. He explains that religion is a natural human phenomenon which is, quote, sufficiently distinct from and irreducible to other phenomena such as speech, assembly, expression, and conscience. And because religious religion is intrinsically valuable for human beings, the right to religious freedom must be considered a right of its own. Failing to safeguard it must be seen as destroying a dimension of intrinsic human flourishing and thus violating the dignity of the human person. Now obviously limits on this freedom relating to safety and order can be imposed to avoid grievous injustices committed in the name of religion, but such limitations ought to be imposed very carefully. Now I needn't tell a room full of lawyers that protection for religious freedom finds a place twice in the First Amendment and that this Supreme Court, consistent with the intent of the founders, has made clear that these two clauses work in tandem with each other. And the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which celebrated its 75th anniversary this past December, also gives place of pride for religious freedom, stating that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, and that this right includes, quote, freedom, either alone or in community with others, 
and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. And let's not forget that just 30 years ago, Congress passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which mandates that, quote, government shall not substantially burden a person's exercise of religion, even if the burden results from a rule of general applicability. Some of the names involved in the ultimate passage of RIFRA may surprise you. Then Senator Joseph Biden introduced an initial version of the legislation in 1990. And three years later, RIFRA was introduced in the House of Representatives by Congressman Chuck Schumer. A unanimous House and nearly unanimous Senate passed the bill, and President Bill Clinton signed RIFRA into law. Fast forward three decades. Former champions of religious freedom are now skeptics, questioning religious freedom's distinctiveness. Some even brand traditional religious beliefs as bigotry in the face of demands for unfettered access to abortion and the inclusion of sexual orientation and gender ideology in non-discrimination laws and beyond. Freedom of belief and conscience is replaced by insistence on total conformity and acceptance. In my opinion, that's pretty scary, scary stuff. My co-panelist, Julie Blake, will be discussing the current administration's proposed rules related to Title IX and Section 1557, so I'll highlight four other examples of the administration failing to protect religious liberty in advancing what it claims to be mere non-discrimination policies. As Elizabeth mentioned, the current administration pounced on the Supreme Court's expansion in Bostock versus Clayton County of the reach of Title VII's prohibition on sex discrimination in the workplace to include sexual orientation and gender identity. Failing to give proper notice to the fact that the court specifically mentioned that it was not reaching the issue of religious objections. On the day of his inauguration, President Biden issued an executive order directing federal agencies to fully enforce Title VII and other laws that prohibit discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. Consistent with Biden's order, the Equal Oppor Employment Opportunity Commission, an ostensibly bipartisan federal agency, has issued proposed guidance that, quote, sex-based harassment includes harassment on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, including how that identity is expressed. Harassment, according to the guidance, includes, quote, intentional and repeated use of a name or pronoun inconsistent with the individual's gender identity, also known as misgendering. Also included as a form of harassment is the denial of access to a bathroom or other sex-segregated facility consistent with the individual's gender identity. So what if employers and employees are not willing to abandon traditional religious beliefs grounded in biological reality in order to adopt preferred pronouns or do away with sex-specific restrooms or locker rooms? The guidance is unforgiving. Quote, employers do not and cannot provide Title VII religious accommodations for behavior that is considered harassment. Meanwhile, the State Department has proposed rules which apply to award recipients and contractors for foreign assistance. The rules would impose non-discrimination requirements that extend to gender identity or expression. Granted, the State Department can grant waivers, but given the President's directive to impose gender ideology across all departments and agencies, this is a bit of an empty promise. Faith-inspired organizations in particular are likely to find their religious convictions excluding them from participating in government-funded relief work. And while waivers are allowed for a religious entity to hire co-religionists, that doesn't mean that they'll be allowed to make hiring and firing decisions based on the organization's founding principles. All this makes a mockery of our commitment to promoting religious freedom as a foreign policy priority as enshrined in the International Religious Freedom Act. Now, using the power of the purse to impose ideological conformity is also at play in a final rule jointly issued this March by no fewer than nine agencies related to federally funded social services. Among other offenses, the rule calls for rescinding 
existing regulatory language that clarifies that the exemption in Title VII, Section 702, which permits re religious organizations to employ individuals of a particular religion to carry out their work and includes acceptance or adherence to religious tenets of the organization. This change suggests that employees don't actually have to believe in or agree with a religion's teaching. They just have to identify as a member of that religion. And finally, HHS has proposed a new rule requiring state child welfare agencies to ensure that each child in their care who identifies as LGBTQI plus receives, quote, a safe and appropriate placement in services. Now that sounds reasonable, but look at what comes next. The rule adds that, quote, to be considered a safe and appropriate placement, a provider, a foster parent, is expected to utilize the child's identified pronouns, chosen name, and allow the child to dress in age-appropriate manner that the child believes reflects their self-identified gender identity and expression. If this proposed rule is finalized, we could be looking at widespread rejection of prospective foster families for children, particularly those who identify as LGBTQI+, simply because they hold sincere religious beliefs about the nature of the human person. And for any child desperate to be placed in a loving home, reducing the number of homes is beyond cruel. Two last points to consider. First, many people of faith who are unwilling to submit to these demands for conformity are not discriminating based on sex, but instead acting on the basis of religious adherence. And second, some argue that instead of just making religious freedom arguments in response to these demands, it's important to make truth arguments. And my response is to note that for people of faith who are raising religious freedom objections, they do so precisely because they believe the religious teaching they're adhering to is true. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Julie? Well, th thank you so much uh, for having me, and uh, thank you for my co-panelists, especially uh, Marty, for joining us today. I think we all appreciate a good debate here. So my, my thesis is, uh, is simple, but uh, takes a little issue with the premise of the panel. Uh, religious freedom is important, but religious freedom is not enough. And that is more true than ever when it comes to the Biden administration's whole of the government agenda uh, on the subject of gender identity and its very related subject of abortion, um, where many of these civil rights laws, sex discrimination laws, are being redefined to encompass both new categories. The issue that we have in society is if religious groups respond to these laws simply by saying, I'd like my exemption, please. Like, you can apply to everyone else, but not me. We are failing to engage with the real issues about the common good, about truth, and about reality. And we should not cede the public square. We have an obligation to care for everyone, whether or not they belong to our same religion or not. And I think that that is profoundly true in the context of the Biden administration's forthcoming rules on Title IX and Section 1557. So I'll take them one by one and show you that while religious freedom is important, it is not enough for each of these rules. So, first of all, Title IX. Uh, what is the new Title IX rule? So Title IX is a federal statute. It applies to every person who takes federal funding in any form from the federal government if you have any form of educational entity receiving the funding. So most of the funding goes through the Department of Education, but not all of it. Uh, sometimes it can go through the Department of Agriculture, like for school lunch program. Um, but the Department of Education is creating a new Title IX rule. Uh, it's replacing the Trump Title IX rule. Uh, the Trump rule uh, really dealt with things like due process, campus speech. Um, those, those are important concerns, but they're not gonna be the focus of, of this panel today. Uh, the Biden Title IX rule, in addition to addressing the, the due process issues on campus, is also redefining the substantive categories of Title IX in reliance on the President's executive order interpreting Bostock. And they are redefining sex to include gender identity and uh, termination of pregnancy, meaning abortion. Um, 
And it's important to realize that the, the Biden administration has technically proposed two rules. Uh, one is a main Title IX rule where it says this redefinition applies to all aspects of education, um, what, whatever that is. So that could be in the classroom, it could be um, PE classes, uh, sports teams, nothing's excluded from this redefinition. And then they had a, a second rule about sports where they said, well, well, maybe in theory there might possibly be one time that a male couldn't play on a female sports team if he wants, um, but you know, under a very difficult balancing and evidentiary test. Uh, that second rule apparently has been canned and is not being released before the election uh, for fairly obvious political reasons. So what we're left with is the main Title IX rule, which is expected to be released any day now. It's already left the White House's uh, review. And this Title IX rule will affect all operations of any uh, school that receives federal funding. So that includes um, school districts, public universities, as well as private universities that take federal funding. So the, to move on to the next question of this panel, um, did the agencies overreach by expanding sex non-discrimination provisions to encompass gender identity in this role? And my, my answer is, is simply yes. The point of Title IX was to help women achieve equal educational opportunities. And Title IX is not a sex blindness statute. Title IX is an accommodation statute. It is an equal opportunity statute. And by redefining sex to mean gender identity, the Biden administration is threatening the equal opportunities that women fought so very hard to achieve. And I'd submit further that it is a major question that Congress would have debated to allow men onto female sports teams and to end women's sports. I think up until very recently, everyone knew the whole point of Title IX was for women's opportunities, was for their equal athletic opportunities, not to make women spectators in their own sports. Uh, and that really underscores the importance of this rule uh, when it comes to is religious freedom enough? And it's, it's not enough because there's no woman who should be forced to compete against a male on an athletic team. Everyone knows that men have, on average, great physical advantages. Their hearts are stronger, their muscles are stronger, they can run faster. Uh, having females play against male in sports creates physical danger for females. And it only takes one male to make the playing field unequal, as we all saw so very vividly with Leah Thomas and Riley Gaines when he took the women's titles in the NCAA swimming championships. Regardless of a female athlete's religion, regardless of whether she attends a religious school or not, she should not be forced to compete against males in sports. And that's something that we should all be able to agree. And religious freedom categories simply don't address that important question. And ignoring the biological reality that males and females are different is not going to help the problem. Um, I think that it's important to realize then that Title IX's religious exemption will help solve some of these problems, but not all of them. So in Title IX has a religious exemption saying that Title IX shall not apply to any entity uh, controlled by a religious organization. So in theory, that means that if you have, take my alma mater, Notre Dame, um, Notre Dame is a religious entity, um, if it conflicts with Notre Dame's religion, it won't apply to Notre Dame as such. Well, that, that's all very well and good. But what happens when Notre Dame wants to take the basketball court against UConn? And let us say hypothetically that UConn is allowing a male to compete um, on the basketball court. What, what is Notre Dame to do then? And this isn't hypothetical, it's real. My organization, Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, represents female athletes who have already lost countless podium spots, championship opportunities, and being forced to compete against males. We represent a school in Vermont, um, Mid Valley uh, Christian, where uh, they had to forfeit a match when they unexpectedly uh, were asked to compete against a team that was fielding a male athlete and their female athletes were unable to do so. In response, the Vermont Principals Association uh, kicked Mid-Vermont Christian out of the sports league entirely. Uh, do we want that ha to happen to the NCAA? I, I think not. And so what we have then is a situation where even if um, religious schools themselves are not subject 
to Title IX directly, there are going to be serious collateral effects of this Title IX rule on religious schools. Um, we're seeing it already in Vermont. And so that's why we need to consider that um, do, do we want a world where college sports are going to be uh, separated based um, on these principles, or do we want to maintain the vibrant um, sphere of athletics that our, our country has historically had? Um, I, I think there's also, uh, you know, some, some additional religious freedom questions at the margins about um, policing the Title IX religious exemption. Uh, what I found is that in practice, um, there, are, there are people who would like to get rid of the Title IX religious exemption entirely. There's a case in Oregon called uh, Hunter versus Department of Education uh, where a group of students sued, claiming the Title IX religious exemption violates the Establishment Clause. Um, my organization represents several intervening schools de defending that exemption, and thus far it has been successfully defended. However, that question is before the Ninth Circuit right now. Um, additional uh, questions remain about the enforcement of Title IX's religious exemption in practice. Um, when the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, redefined Title IX for purposes of the National School Lunch Program, uh, the state implementing agencies didn't pay attention to religious freedom at all. Uh, one of my clients, Grant Park Christian Academy, a low-income uh, school in a predominantly uh, black neighborhood, uh, was told that, quote, you don't need to participate in the school lunch program. Um, and it took a federal lawsuit to get the Department of Agriculture to walk back and restore the children's lunch money. California, not to be outdone, then denied a uh, lunch money program uh, to the Church of Compassion, which operated a preschool and daycare. Um, and it, it held to its proceedings throughout, uh, to its position throughout administrative proceedings, and even in federal court, until facing a prospect, again, of a federal lawsuit, it eventually backed down and um, agreed to a settlement with a large amount of attorney's fees. But none of these things should have taken lawsuits to police the Title IX religious exemption. Uh, so then moving on to uh, the Section 1557 rule, and you would be forgiven if you're like, what is the Section 1557 rule? This sounds like a, a bunch of garbled numbers that I don't know about. Um, just think of it this way, it's Title IX for healthcare. Uh, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, incorporated Title IX into healthcare. It simply said Title IX shall apply to healthcare. So redefining sex in Title IX does not stop within education. It applies to all healthcare operations in America. And the Biden administration is making that very clear that it applies to all healthcare providers as well as to most healthcare insurance programs. And this creates even more serious problems because if biological reality matters in sports, it matters even more in medicine. It is simply dangerous for doctors to ignore um, good medicine and biological reality in the service of a new non-discrimination principle. And frankly, it is very hard to overstate the impact of this threatened rule change in medicine. Um, the rule forces uh, healthcare providers to perform gender transition procedures and abortions under its redefinition of sex discrimination. It is apparently discrimination to discriminate um, against gender dysphoria. So for example, if a doctor is a surgeon who performs hysterectomies, the doctor and is willing to perform a hysterectomy on a woman with a cancerous uterus to save her life, the Department of Health and Human Services says that same doctor must perform a hysterectomy if the woman seeks to more uh, physically resemble a male and no longer have a uterus. That means doctors who use uh, medicines to treat precocious puberty will have to prescribe puberty blockers to halt the natural development of minors. Uh, Pro-life clinics that offer abortion pill reversal with the use of progesterone will have to provide cross-sex hormones for so-called gender transitions. Um, doctors who manage miscarriages will have to do abortions under the same non-discrimination rule as applied to abortion. Uh, doctors who uh, refer pregnant teens for OB care will have to refer them to Planned Parenthood. They must use patient self-selected pronouns. Everyone in the medical field will, and this is an example from the rule, have to refer to a woman on demand as a man, even if she is giving birth or pregnant. Uh, simply put, this, th this will turn medicine upside down. It will force doctors who do good to do evil, and it will harm patients. Um, the Biden administration has grossly abused its power. It uh, says that Title IX's religious exemption does not apply to the Affordable Care Act, 
that uh, it incorporated all the parts of Title IX it liked, but not the religious exemption, and definitely not Title IX's um, abortion neutrality provi provisions as well. And so the religious freedom conflicts are going to be teed up even more acutely in this healthcare con context. You're going to have serious problems under RFRA involving free speech, um, as well as all of the questions under uh, federal conscience laws that protect against participations in abortion sterilizing procedures. And HHS, in response to all those concerns, has taken the position of, well, if, if you think you've got some constitutional or other statutory rights here, go ahead, take your chance in enforcement proceedings. And that is simply not enough, whether you're religious or not. No one should be forced to harm patients. Thank you. Marty? Thanks so much, Elizabeth and Andrea and Julie. It's a pleasure to be here again. Um, I'm grateful that so many of you turned out. I figured with the um, adjacent room dealing with uh, interposition and battles between state and states and the federal government at the border, there'd be no one here, but um, I'm glad to see um, some of you care about these issues as well. I'm going to focus um, a, a little bit more on the, um, on the stated topic of the panel, that is to say religious liberty um, when it comes to non-discrimination rules in the Biden administration. Let me start by saying I, I served uh, at the Department of Justice for the first 30 months of the administration, was very familiar with many of the rules and other policies discussed here, though not all of them, um, um, incl including a couple more recent ones that Andrea has brought up. Um, but I'm obviously not going to convey any confidential information. I'll base this completely on the public record, and I don't know what's been happening since July. I'm, I'm like you, I'm just on the outside looking in. And in particular, the Title IX and 1557 final rules have yet to be issued, and so I will be make, my comments will be based on the NPRM, on the proposed rules, um, which, which, which in certain areas are, are much more, um, much more non-committal than, than Julie has suggested, I think. Um, my basic theme is that I don't recognize the, the description that my co-panelists have given for the administration's um, posture toward religious liberty, um, or for that matter, toward abortion and gender-affirming care. Um, it is not a surprise at all to me, having served in the Clinton, Obama, and, and, and Bush, and um, Biden administration that Senator Biden proposed RIFRA and that President Clinton signed it. It was one of President Clinton's um, most um, proudest achievements to work with this, this bipartisan coalition. Um, the Biden administration is very much committed to religious liberty and has taken extraordinary steps over and over to ensure that exactly the sorts of uh, principles and values that Andrea so eloquently described are preserved in federal law and that Congress's balance between non-discrimination rules and religious liberty are honored. I'll just tick off some, but I could, I, there, there are more. And then I'd like to focus a little bit on a couple of the things that my co-panelists have said uh, to give what I think is a quite different picture of how these rules would work, what they would do, and, the, and how they would apply both to religious objectors and to um, persons who don't have a religious or a conscience-based um, objection, because some of the statutes protect both religion and conscience that is not religiously based. So on his first day in office, President Biden rescinded the Muslim ban, right, rescinded probably the ugliest form of religious discrimination that we've encountered from the federal government in recent years. Um, he also um, has taken steps to preserve um, sacred sites of tribal nations, such as the Pinal Divide National Monument, Bears, uh, Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monuments and the like. He signed hate crimes legislation to protect against um, violence on the basis of religion, among other characteristics. And the Justice Department, in which I worked, is deeply committed to enforcing such hate, hate crimes laws, including against very vituperative and horrifying anti-religious forms of violence. He has released a national strategy to counter anti-Semitism, announced the development of a national strategy to counter Islamophobia and related forms of bias and discrimination, and taken all sorts of other steps to do that. And in the context of anti-discrimination laws in particular, um, all of these agencies and the president have been quite 
remarkably, not remarkably, I think quite unremarkably, but predictably and consistently um, insistent that the, the, the many statutory and in some cases constitutional protections for religious liberty will be enforced and will be honored by this administration and are important. Um, the HHS has promulgated, this was after my time, promulgated a conscience rule that goes through in elaborate detail um, of all the different statutes and, and including RIFRA, but also including particular um, health and abortion based uh, conscience statutes that will be honored, the way in which the agency will do so, and the like. Um, I just don't recognize this picture of an anti-religious um, administration um, at all. And I'm not just saying that, it was part of my job to, to make sure that these statutes um, were, were understood and were enforced within the federal government. Um, and, and it just doesn't describe the daily reality that I can assure you um, re really uh, is, is present in all of the agencies and, and in the White House. Now, are there times in which religious liberty claims come in conflict with other important norms that the president is very much committed to, reproductive freedom, non-discrimination, the like? Of course, but the point here is that Congress has, in many cases, and the First Amendment and others, has, you know, has created some balance and some room for religious exceptions, and those are being honored by the, by the administration. I'm unaware, Elizabeth asked before, am I aware of cases in which the administration has actually rejected a, a, any like serious claims for religious exemptions under any of these statutes or any litigation in which this issue has really been teed up? And I'm not really aware. There hasn't been a lot of post-Bostock, um, I, I think a little bit surprisingly, there hasn't been a lot of post-Bostock litigation of religious objectors wanting exemptions to for sexual orientation discrimination laws under Title VII or Title IX or 1557 or Title VI or what have you. There's been a few cases. Um, the one that reached the Fifth Circuit, um, the EEOC in that case didn't object on the merits to, to, the, to the religious exemption claim that was being made. They thought it was premature and that the plaintiff hadn't described what their objection was. and and that they ha weren't trying to enforce the statute, again, the Title VII against the plaintiff. So I, I, I may be wrong, but I think um, there's not a lot to talk about in terms of post bostic litigation, and certainly not any indication of hostility from the Biden administration to religious liberty, religious, object religious exemption claims. And in fact, the Solicitor General has, has filed some briefs in cases m many of you are familiar with in the Supreme Court, supporting religious liberty and free speech and free exercise rights including the brief that the court unanimously followed in Groff, the, the undue hardship Title VII <coughs> accommodation case last term, including a brief in Shirtleff, another unanimous decision about the right of a Christian organization to raise a Christian flag during its um, event in, uh, in the city of Boston and the like. So I think, that it, I, I think it's fair to say, I don't, I'm not gonna claim the administration has done everything right or in every case made the judgments that everyone in this room might agree with, but I think on the whole, caricaturing, characterizing it as anti-religious and hostile to religious liberty um, is somewhat of a caricature. Um, and it's really interesting when you look at some of these recent cases, if you go look at the Justice Department briefs, um, where plaintiffs are bringing claims arguing that the administration is, for instance, requiring people against their conscience to, to provide gender affirming care and the Justice Department comes in on behalf of HHS and says we're not requiring any such thing. And you get, court, you get very conservative jurists, both in writing and in the Fifth Circuit's recent oral argument in one of these cases saying, there's no there there. What, what are you complaining about? The government is not trying to force you to do these things. So we're gonna get into some of the details of this um, in, in our back and forth of these things, but I did wanna um, just say a few things about that. A, a, about the things that, that Julie has raised first very quickly and then maybe we can get further into the weeds. I wanna make sure we cover things that you folks are all interested in in the question and answer session. So Julie mentioned, for instance, the Hunter case in Oregon um, involving a claim by plaintiffs that the Title IX religious organization exemption is unconstitutional. Well, the Biden Justice Department is in court vigorously arguing against that successfully 
on Julie's on ADF side, side by side with ADF, and has successfully defended that religious exemption. Um, but let me talk for a minute about 1557 in particular. Um, when we, during the Q&A and during our discussion, if you guys are interested, I'm happy to talk about Title IX and the athletics rule in particular, although as Julie pointed out, that one has been, my understanding is that, that the final rule has been postponed. I think even the proposed rule there was quite moderate um, and quite an exception to the ordinary Title IX rules and was um, quite cautious in what it was proposing, but was very open-minded open in inviting comments, and they got tens or hundreds of thousands of comments. And so that rule's not there yet. I know that's the issue du jour, and that people probably want to talk about um, transgender women of, uh, competing with cisgender women on sports teams. Happy to do so if that's what people want to talk about. But the administration on that topic has been rather cautious and hasn't done anything very dramatic yet in any event. Um, but on 1557, I want to make uh, one thing that I think is important. Julie suggests that the rule, the proposed rule, we don't know what the final rule would look like. The proposed rule would require, even, even apart from religious objections and religious exemptions, which the rule, by the way, sets up an entire system for people raising religious objection claims and having them honored. The rule goes to great lengths to say that the rule, that the substantive rules that are put in place will be subject to all of the conscience and religious statutory and constitutional um, exemption claims that are available. But apart from that, Julie suggests that if you're not, if you don't have one of those exemptions, if you don't satisfy it, you simply don't want to do what the HHS would have you do. It will require people to engage in, gen in gender affirming care and to actually either perform or subsidize abortions against their will. So that's just not the case. So the rule doesn't do either of those things. It doesn't suggest that people have to perform abortions. And in fact, section 1802, 18023 of the ACA has a specific provision saying, cited in the NPRM, that says that no one can be required to perform abortions. The, the principal thing the statute does is simply to say, which it said since 1975 in the Title IX context, that, have, that a termination of pregnancy, like bringing a pregnancy to term, is not a ground on which someone can discriminate against you. And ADF itself agrees that when it comes to miscarriage, for instance, the, the law is such that you can't discriminate against someone for having had a miscarriage. Well, this says, in addition, you can't discriminate against people for having exercised their right to have an abortion either, but it doesn't require anyone to provide or pay for an abortion. At least the, the proposed rule didn't. I'm not, I don't know what the final rule will say. Nor does it require folks who don't provide pr particular services to engage in gender-affirming care that they otherwise would not provide. Now there are, there is a provision in the 1557 rule that suggests that, that not providing care simply because of a, of a, um, a, a, of a belief that treating gender, that treating dysphoria itself through transition care of any kind is wrong would raise questions under 1557. Even on that, it's quite ambiguous, and I'm looking forward to seeing what the final rule would say. But so far, there's been no movement at all by HHS or any other federal agency to require anyone to engage in gender-affirming care that they oppose or that they don't otherwise provide, let alone to perform abortions. And whenever these cases get into court complaining about that, what you're seeing now is judges saying, there's no there there. Why can't, literally one of the judges said, why can't you take yes for an answer? Um, so I, I would like to push back and suggest that things may not be quite what they, you know, what they appear to be uh, uh, under some descriptions of what the Biden administration is doing and that it is actually quite committed to religious liberty and to compliance with all of the relevant constitutional and statutory provisions. Thank you, so we'll have time for audience Q&A, but I want to pose a question or two before we get to that. So th the first one, um, Julie, we'll start with you, although I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on this. The, the administration is, is plowing ahead, um, assuming that 
the court's interpretation of Title VII's uh, definition of sex discrimination applies in other contexts, other statutory contexts. Is that a valid assumption, or are these statutes different enough that they should be treated differently? Thanks. So I, I think that's the, the real question. Is President Biden right that Bostock just applies to every other federal sex discrimination statute, every other civil rights statute, or are there meaningful differences between Title VII and other statutes like Title IX, Section 1557, uh, or other laws with their own sex discrimination provisions? And I think that's the issue that these rules are going to force to a final decision, at, probably by the U.S. Supreme Court to make a decision, is, is it the same or not? Um, you know, Bostock itself was clear that it concerned hiring and firing only within Title VII. Uh, it said it didn't concern um, restrooms, bathrooms, locker rooms, or anything else of the kind. And, and it made that caveat knowingly that there can be important biological realities that need to be recognized in those contexts. And um, it also said that it was deeply concerned about religious freedom. So, it, so Bostock certainly recognized the role of RIFRA and other constitutional provisions um, as well. Um, and then you get to the question of whether Bostock's hermeneutic necessarily carries over to the interpretation of other statutes. And I think that's uh, the issue that's so important to realize that what uh, Bostock identified in Title VII was essentially a sex blindness but for test. Uh, but not every statute requires blindness to the protected category. So for example, when you have the Americans with Disabilities Act or Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, you have accommodation for disability, not blindness to a disability, because ignoring people's disabilities don't actually give disabled people equal opportunities. So too with Title IX. Ignoring women was not going to solve the problem the country faced in 1972 of a lack of women's equal opportunities in education. And so that's why Title IX, and then by extension 5057, when it incorporates Title IX, are different from Title VII. They are equal opportunity statutes, accommodation statutes, not statutes that have the same but-for causation strict standard uh, that Title VII has been interpreted uh, to have. Um, as well, I think many of the, the conflicts under these statutes are going to um, encounter questions well beyond the narrow hiring and firing context uh, that Bostock had, things like equal access uh, to locker rooms, um, sports teams, uh, medical decisions. And, and if I could just briefly res respond to Marty, it's, it's true, if a doctor's scope of practice does not include, uh, say, performing hysterectomies or providing hormones, they won't be required to do so. But if they provide hormones or hysterectomies for one diagnosis, they will be required to do so for a diagnosis of gender dysphoria, or at the very least, they cannot take a categorical position uh, that gender transition efforts are per se um, experimental, uh, dangerous, uh, or harmful. And then, although the rule itself was deliberately vague on abortion, it, it led one to think that the same procedures, if they could be applied to a miscarriage, would, would need to be applied to abortion under the same rationale that the Department of Education was doing. So um, that, that's why I think you're going to have a lot of fights here, well beyond religious freedom, but certainly, you're going to have serious problems for religious freedom um, w w when uh, these rules come out, if, if they are what they appear to be at the proposal stage. Do you have any comments? Oh, I do. <laughs> Andrew, yeah, yeah. Andrew? I don't want to, like, jump on Marty. You're awesome. Um, no, I wanted to say first off, I wanted to... Um, celebrate and agree with you the points that you mentioned that where the administration has taken very pro-religious um, positions, especially on combating anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and that is um, consistent with the American tradition. And it is something that I think everyone in this room needs to be celebrating. These are serious times that we're in. Um, there have been examples, though, where the administration's response has been either non-existent or anemic, right? So with a vigorous enforcement of the Freedom to Access to Clinic Entrances Act against um, anti-abortion protesters, the administration's protection of church entrances, which is included in FACE, has basically been zero. And that's, that's a problem, and it's, it's not, unfortunately not unique to the Biden administration, and this has been 
you know, a problem with people's understanding of what, what face should cover, but particularly necessary, a response has been particularly necessary after um, the rise in vandalism and attacks to both churches and pro-life pregnancy centers after the leaked Dobbs um, uh, memo and, and the decision. Um, the other thing that I would mention is, um, you know, you, you're, with all due respect, um, saying, you know, there's nothing to see here. I think that there is nothing to see here, and that's a problem. Um, there are enforcement actions that are not going on. Um, and Julie will speak in particular about um, stuff involving HHS, but I can think of, you know, a case involving Vermont University Hospital where there was an HHS investigation under the prior administration and that was kind of fiddled out. Um, and a nurse in that university hospital who had made her, her position on not wanting to participate in abortion was found herself in the midst of uh, that and had to actually um, engage in that. That's that's a problem. There's also a, a problem just, um, you know, personnel's pro uh, a policy. Um, I don't know if, if you, you probably know Eric Cheney, adorable, love him. Maybe a lot of the people here in, in our gathering know him. He was, you know, the Civil Rights Division's person on religion there for, through several different um, administrations, retired and where's the next person on religion. Um, and if you look at DOJ's, you know, highlighted briefs, you'll see very few um, outside of RELUPA, which again, great that the uh, Justice Department is very uh, engaged in defending the religious rights of people that are in institutions incarcerated. But um, getting out there with amicus briefs, especially in the context of the conversation that we're having right now, where religious freedom and non-discrimination laws appear to clash, you hear crickets. Um, and, and or, in the case of uh, the court's recent review of that, not specifically on a free exercise issue, but on free speech and 303 Creative, the administration took the side of the respondents and not the side of Lori Smith, um, and they lost. You know, so they were taking the wrong side. Um, but I would expect that um, the administration would be more robust in its defense of religious freedom because I don't think these need to necessarily be either or rights. Um, and that's something that I think we need to build in. And, and with all due respect to Julie as well, I think that religious freedom as a placeholder is crucial and indispensable um, we can think, for example, of the amazing Little Sisters of the Poor who um, fought repeatedly, won repeatedly, to create that placeholder to not have to um, uh, capitulate and include um, abortion, abortion pills and contraceptive in general in, in their employee health care plans. Their employees are like nuns. So um, that, that was a, a fight that was fought hard and for a very long time, and I'm concerned that the, um, the rules that were created with all of the stakeholders, those that had concerns about the Affordable Care Act's overreach, um, have since been um, watered down, and, and I think it's important if the administration wants to be recognized as being pro-religious freedom, then there needs to be a lot more effort on the ground to bring in stakeholders and try to figure out what their concerns are um, while they're, they're crafting rules. And the rules that I mentioned um, that were finalized, there were a gajillion comments, and reading through those gajillion comments, not much was done to respond to them as far as preserving religious freedom. So. Um, I think that there is, there is, it's an important time where we, we can come together, um, defenders of religious freedom, advocates for expanded non-discrimination laws, find a way in which we can all get along. And the first step is that we can say absolute conformity isn't necessary 
that we will, just as the Supreme Court has said repeatedly, respect that good people, people of good will, will have different um, positions on this, many of which are grounded in, in their religious beliefs. So I'm pleased to say that I, I have a great deal of agreement with both Julie and Andrea on, in their latest comments. Um, certainly, I, that's the sense that I have within the Biden administration as well, Andrea. I'm not, I'm not here, I don't know as much as you do probably about some of the particular either enforcement or non-enforcement decisions that might have been made. That wasn't my job really um, in the way that these broader policy and, and rulemaking and litigation issues were and compliance with uh, the statutes were. Um, my sense is that you know, I don't think there's been a lot of litigation in which, the, in which people have been bringing RFRA or, or conscience claims um, against non-discrimination laws in which the U.S. even had a decision to make whether to appear as amicus. I may be wrong about that. I, I haven't tried to keep up with that. Maybe folks in the audience know otherwise. Um, but, but I generally share that sentiment, and my sense is that so does the president, and so do the people around the president, certainly people in every agency do. I will say I am very familiar with one of the rules you mentioned, um, the, the nine agency rule in, in involving social services. And I think those of you who are very interested in Supreme Court doctrine, involving doctrine, Zellman and Mitchell versus Helms and Bowen versus Kendrick and Fulton and, and um, Trinity Lutheran and all of the, and Carson versus Macon, will see that we took those questions extremely seriously and dealt with the, the, the extensive comments on those questions in that rule. And I, I for one, think that the, that the result is correct and, and, and actually implements President Bush's executive order, which um, to, to a T, almost, almost verbatim. Um, another thing I would, another thing I'm particularly proud of, partly, I mean, I'm proud of the Department of Education for doing it, but I've been involved in several iterations of, some of you may have seen, it didn't get a lot of attention, but the Department of Education put out a new version of the guidance, now statutorily required guidance on prayer and religious expression in public schools um, last year. Um, it's the third or fourth iteration of that. This is a post-Kennedy versus Bremerton version of it. I think it's quite good and extremely useful for public school officials, students, and teachers um, going forward. And that's the sort of thing that a lot of energy is expended on. But let me just respond quickly to Julie. We, we agree, I, I very much disagree about the, the high level premise, which that there's a hard question of whether Bostick applies to discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gen, transgender um, status uh, it, with respect to all these other statutes. I think that's an easy question. I think the courts of appeals are getting it right. I don't think there's gonna be any dispute. I think the rationale of Bostick carries over quite readily um, when you talk about it. And that's on the assumption that sex, the word sex in all of these statutes, I'm quoting from Justice Gorsuch here, refers only to biological distinctions between male and female. And that's been the predicate actually for these rules, has been assuming arguendo that sex means bi physiological, right, anatomical differences Treating someone differently because of their anatomy is a form of action on the basis of sex. That's the rationale of Bostick. I think that carries over very naturally and almost unobjectionably to these other statutes. Where I agree with Julie, however, is that unlike in Title VII, these other statutes allow for, in certain contexts, allow for either a separation of or distinct treatment of people on the basis of sex in certain contexts more than Title VII does even before you get to religious liberty claims. And it does so in two ways. This is described in great length in the NPRM on Title IX. The first is that, certain, it, it, is that in certain respects, if a, the general rule is schools cannot separate boys and girls, male and female, on the basis of their biology in, in educational programs. That's the baseline rule, but there are exceptions to it, and the way the education department has understood it, and I think correctly, is that where, the harm, where there are de minimis or less harms of such separation, it is not a form of prohibited discrimination. And even in a couple of contexts, even where there might be those sorts of harms as to certain 
students, such as transgender students. The statute itself provides its own exemption or exception to allow for certain things that otherwise would be prohibited sex discrimination. The most obvious example of which is section 1686, which allows schools to have male and female dormitories, right? Um, living facilities can be separated on the basis of sex. So Julie, I think, is right about that, that I think it's pretty, I, I, I disagree with her, I think it's absolutely clear that actually discriminating against someone on the basis of their biology. So for instance, not treating the broken bone of a transgender man, but you treat one of a cisgender man, will obviously be a violation of 1557 and will be a violation of Title IX in the educational context. The harder questions are, as she's pointing out, when, when in the educational context and in the health context, is treating people differently on the basis of biological anatomical considerations. When is that legitimate? When can it be done? How much equity has to be required? And the like. Those sorts of questions are hard under Title IX. They always have been, particularly in the area of athletics, where Congress actually passed an amendment to Title IX a couple years after Title IX was enacted, the Javits Amendment, which encouraged the, Depart the Secretary of Education, then HEW, to, to treat athletics differently for some of the reasons Julie described and others, and to come up with distinct rules that are supposed to result in general equality in the athletics sphere. And that's what the Education Department is trying to do in that NPRM, although I think that it looks like that's at least several months off before that will become a final rule. So I'm a, although I disagree with Julie about the top line about Bostick's application to these other statutes, I do agree that Title IX and 1557 raise issues about what counts as prohibited discrimination and what is exempt from the prohibition on, on discrimination on the basis of sex in areas that, that, aren't, that Title VII does not. And the statutes aren't on all fours in that respect. So in that respect, I very much agree with her. So I want to invite anyone who has a question, come up to the microphone. We don't even need to fill any extra time. There you go. <laughs> Uh, I guess my question is for uh, Julie Blake. It strikes me that um, some of, the, of, of your comments uh, were going to involve the courts in overturning majority views. And by this I mean that the religious exemption normally is, you know, you can go to your catacombs and they won't come burn you out. But some of what you're discussing is Constantinism, which is that we should rule regardless of the majority. And I think the majority has a lot of wrong views, and I, I certainly think on the transgender and the rest of it, it's really bad. But if they get it in a statute, what are the courts supposed to do? In other words, if they say, we, the law gets passed and it says transgender men can play on women's sports teams, um, doesn't religious freedom let us start our own sports uh, leagues? But how would we win? How can you overturn, under current doctrine, uh, majority rule if they actually have passed statutes that are going to be um, based on what I consider, and I think most people over all time have considered, false readings of reality? Right, so I, I think your question focuses on if Congress hypothetically were to pass the Equality Act, or states. Or, or, or states um, if they were to pass the, the Equality Act or the, the Women's Health Protection Act, which has similar principles for, for abortion or, or other laws, and to um, put it in the text that says, yes, these sex discrimination statutes mean this, or, or, or if they simply were to say, these are characteristics on their own uh, that, that we are protecting in, in whatever way, then yes, you wouldn't have the same claim under the Administrative Procedure Act that the agency's rule is contrary to law or lacks statutory authority in, in, in the same way. Um, of, course, of course, my, my, my thesis is that Congress never passed any of these laws. Congress refused to pass these laws. Congress instead passed laws that said sex, uh, knowing very well what gender identity uh, means and, and that it was some, something different. Um, and moreover, that it would be a major question if when everyone was passing Title IX in 1972 and thought they were protecting women's educational qualities, if they were in fact require, requiring the, the end of them. Um, but yes, I, I think if you were in the realm of where you have a statute that requires these things, uh, you would have uh, different questions arise. And 
uh, some of these questions actually would, would apply to these rules too, but let us assume that there was a statute that uh, provided all this. Well, one question would be, is it a spending clause statute? Uh, if so, the language would have to be uh, very clear. If the language were clear, uh, is it still unduly coercive in the amount of federal funding that it threatens, similar to the Affordable Care Act and, and the Medicaid expansion? Um, would there be um, other problems with the preemption of uh, state laws under the Tenth Amendment, perhaps? And then uh, when it comes to individual rights, if any of these laws um, apply in some of the ways we've described, uh, coercing the, the speech of students or of teachers, um, uh, affecting parental rights by having uh, secret uh, you know, gender transitions in schools, uh, telling doctors they can't give their full medical opinions to patients, I think you'd walk into a host of problems under the First and Fourteenth Amendments, um, wholly apart from the religious freedom concerns, which, which would of course still be there under the First Amendment. Um, now, one really interesting question would be, well, what if that statute said RIFRA doesn't apply to this statute? Um, then you'd definitely be in the realm of a constitutional question. Um, but thus far, Congress has not carved out any statutes from RIFRA scope, and of course, my hope is that it will not do so. I had a question about the Smith problem. So aside from whether it's good law or not, my question is how the different panelists see uh, essentially the accommodation. So I think non-discrimination, the Supreme Court maybe dealt with satisfactorily to most of our uh, analysts, maybe not all, but when you move to accommodation, uh, just how much accommodation is appropriate, especially considering the very broad differences that people can have in terms of what they consider religion. So religions that are based on following laws or books or certain um, rulings, going to a, to a building once a week and, and saying prayers as opposed to other types of faith. Um, so how far should accommodation go? So obviously human sacrifice, no. I think we can all agree. <laughs> but uh, or Jehovah's Witnesses, maybe they don't want to give their children medical treatment. Um, but how far would you go and would you consider uh, history and tradition as sort of the limiter of what is religion, sort of where the state's police power ends, these very basic things, like ensure public safety and, and, and health and some morals at the state level. Uh, and if you choose history and tradition for limiting the First Amendment this way, uh, would you also use history and tradition for dealing with sex issues more broadly that came up, uh, where of course the First Amendment, the Constitution, the First Amendment, and the 14th Amendment were all passed during a time when uh, the history and tradition uh, was of coverture and no female involvement at all in any of these things, which necessitated the 19th Amendment to give the right to vote, not wasn't the 14th Amendment that did it by implication. So my question is how you would rec reconcile that at the second level as well. I'm so excited that you asked those questions. There are so many issues in the question that you raised, um, but my favorite is what do we do about Smith? Right, um, and and it seems not that relevant right now. But in light of um, the people that continue to want to present the Equality Act or the Do No Harm Act, which would undermine RIFRA's um, force in certain areas, I think it's important when talking about the executive branch and non-discrimination laws to tackle what do we do about Smith, right? And I think that the the Supreme Court is wrestling with that. Um, I tend to love Justice Alito's um, concurring opinion in the Fulton case that basically eviscerated Smith, and then with all due respect to Justice Scalia, and, um, and, and pointed out we need, to, we need to give life to the First Amendment's protection for religious freedom. At the same time, I think that Justice Barrett, I think it was reasonably said we need to f come up with a workable rule. Workable rules are really hard for courts to do. It's much preferable that Congress lawmakers do that in and with the benefit of insight from administrative agencies, but I think that the most important legislation that could come out of Congress is to figure out how do we move forward. Um, and I'd love to see that that be done in a, in not by the executive branch, but be done much more in the open with uh, lawmakers wrestling with some of these and taking into account people's concerns. I, I agree with Andrea, and in particular in the areas that we're talking about on this panel, and I know the questioner knows this, but you know, this is an area so suffused with statutory protections for conscience and religion, starting with RIFRA, but then in the particulars 
here as well and when it comes to medical treatment, abortion and the like, that one doesn't really need to worry about what the First Amendment does. I will say I'm, I teach the law of religion this semester and both I and my students, maybe it's the way I'm teaching it, don't quite understand what's got the justices in such tension with one another about whether to overrule Smith because what they've created with Fulton and Masterpiece and similar st um, decisions is so much more robust than the pre-Smith Sherbert Yoder regime in terms of guaranteeing religious exemptions that it's not clear what the stakes are about whether Smith, if we went back to Sherbert and Yoder, religious exemptions would diminish vis-a-vis -vis what the court has been doing recently. So it's something of a mystery. I do want to use this just to, be, to, to pivot to one other thing that happened in the last week or so, in part because it raises issues Julie was raising about what folks in this room and folks on you know, my side of the aisle think about religious exemption and religious liberty claims vis-a-vis -vis the, in relation to the substantive debates that are being had about sex discrimination, transgender athletes, abortion, and the like. Which as many of you may know, Indiana has a mini RIFRA. It has a statutory RIFRA. And claims, and then Indiana has recently enacted, in the wake of Dobbs, a very restrictive abortion statute. And that abortion statute was challenged by several different women um, who claim that their religion requires them to obtain abortions under circumstances that Indiana law would otherwise prohibit and saying that Indiana's RIFRA law entitles them to exemptions. And so far it's gone up through two, two levels of the Indiana state courts which have ruled in favor of the women's rights to, um, to obtain abortions. Strange, strangely not discussing at all how they would get them because there were no doctors in the case. But, but, but putting that aside, what was really striking to me is the hostility toward this litigation from folks who have spent many years passionately committed to religious exemptions, um, including the Beckett Fund, which actually, shockingly in my view, filed a brief suggesting that these women, among all of the religious exemption plaintiffs of recent years, are insincere about their beliefs about what their religion requires. Um, a remarkable brief. Um, that, that I think is worthy of some attention and some concern to my, to my mind about what's really going on here. And I wonder whether um, religious liberty is really what's driving a lot of this litigation or whether it isn't in fact more along the lines of the substantive debates on both sides, mind you. People care about the substantive questions. Obviously, these are very, these are very important. Um, substantive questions on which people have very deeply held beliefs apart from religious exemptions. But it, 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 the Indiana case is really one to watch, in particular how the uh, religious exemption groups and communities treat that case as it goes forward. I feel incredibly validated because I just wrote about the Indiana case. Oh, great. <laughs> I'm looking forward to watching. Yeah, no, you should you'd love it. You're going to love the piece. Um, <laughs> but I actually take the side of Beckett on both this specific case of people presenting a religious claim to an abortion, similar to um, claims by the Satanic Temple. I don't know if you've followed this line of, of cases. Both they've ar argued, and I guess they, Satanists do believe that there's like a religious ritual behind um, uh, abortion, but the Satanic Temple, which is different than Satanists, are claiming it because they want to make a, a, a mockery of religion. And they've done that in, in Texas. They were actually trying to force um, I think it was HHS to pro provide abortion um, consistent with religious freedom responsibilities. They've also incidentally gone after um, elementary schools where Bible study clubs are held after school on school facilities to ask for after school Satan clubs using religious freedom principles in order to um, push that agenda. Mind you, claiming at the same time that they're not really Satanists. So it's a little um, hard to figure out. But I, I think that there is um, a very big issue at, at stake that, you know, religious freedom is kind of the hot issue in the, in the court right now. And I would love to see its proper understanding um, and its proper application. That's where I'd love to see the, the, the Supreme Court um, and the, the Department of Justice provide measured briefs. I thought that Beckett's brief was very measured. I do think that there are issues in general. We don't question the truth of a person's belief. 
and we're, we're um, reluctant to question the sincerity, but when it looks like religious freedom is being um, an argument that's convenient as opposed to a genuine argument for advancing um, a claim, then I do think that it's appropriate for the court to, to question that. And, and I would say, and I may get people um, disagreeing with me, I saw that there were people making political arguments under the guise of religious freedom during the pandemic to uh, oppose masks and things like that. And I think that it's worth questioning um, the sincerity of the belief as being either religious or politically grounded. Um, so I do think that, that it's, um, I disagree with Professor <laughs> Lederman on, on the, the validity of the claims, but I do think that it's a really important issue um, that the courts are going to be uh, facing, not just in Indiana, but there are, I think, eight states where their laws, their um, regulations surrounding abortion have been challenged on religious freedom grounds in like 12 cases wow. in those eight. Um, do we have time? Because we have at least one more question. I could, we could go yeah. on all day on this topic <laughs> so alone, and, and it's really interesting, but I want to make sure you get your question in. We, we are actually at the, the end of our time. Um, can we do, can she quickly interject? Maybe there's a quick Very, very quickly. She's been very patient. I was, I, thank you very much. I was going to take the invitation to jump on Marty. <laughs> jump! <laughs> but you've got to do it quickly, quickly. All right. I'll just say, it seemed to me you took the enormous amount of effort in your comments to say that the administration was culturally very attuned to religious freedom. And on the cultural level, I was struck by the fact that you opened with uh, repealing the Muslim ban, which of course was not religiously founded, that was in, directed to national security, and talking about Indian tribes. And if you had time to talk, I would just raise the issue of what's going on in the Ivy League. No one takes more federal money than them of the energy that is putting in, being put into very real anti-Semitism and whether there is a distinct lack of energy by the administration in pursuing that. So if that was the, feel free to answer, but if that no, was the no, last no, word, I, I, I think you. that, I, Thank you. I, you know, I mentioned the fact that the, the president is, and his administration is deeply committed to, to, to efforts to stop anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. I mean, I think that's pretty apparent. Um, I, I disagree with you about the Muslim ban, but that's an honest disagreement. Agree to disagree. Well, Agree to disagree. <laughs> well, please uh, join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.